Horse racing doesn't take holidays. Let's cap the card over Memorial Day weekend, opening day, Canterbury Park on Saturday. Salutations and welcome, friends. I'm your host of this episode of Capping the Card. My name is Matthew DeSantis, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. Now, before we get into this episode of Capping the Card, please make sure to press that subscribe button here on YouTube to get all of our content here on Trust the Profits as we go through the summer, the Triple Crown season into Saratoga. But listen, there's so many more tracks that we're going to be talking about. And this is a great time of year because some of these more regional tracks are opening up that have been closed over the winter. Just this past Monday, we had a Cinnaboya Downs opening up. On Wednesday, we had Delaware Park opening up. And this weekend, we, of course, have Canterbury Park's opening day. I have a very special guest lined up to help us through that Canterbury Park card on Saturday. Also, make sure to like this video and comment below with what's your best bet on the card on Saturday at Canterbury Park or maybe what you're most looking forward to following up at Canterbury this season. Now, if you're New to capping the card, and based upon the number of followers I've gained from the state of Minnesota, I'm imagine a couple of you might be actually new to this show. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to go races one through nine. We're going to give you our top pick and top value play for every single race. This can be helpful for you in terms of verticals and horizontals, in terms of maybe including some of these horses in a horizontal pick sequence, or building out a vertical ticket of exactus trifectus with some of our value plays, et cetera. So whatever you type of whatever type of ticket you like to play, hopefully you can find some value here with us here on Trust the Profits and on Cap in the Card. As I mentioned, I have a very special guest with me today. When we say Canterbury, there's only one person to go to, and that is a return guest uh, who is with me for the Fountain of Youth Day, actually, down at Gulfstream Park, but she's back up in her home state of Minnesota, and with us at Canterbury Park, Angela Herman joins us. Angela, thank you so much for coming back on Capping the Card. Oh, hey there. I guess I have to put my Minnesota voice on for this round of it, but thank you for having me back. It's an exciting time to handicap just about anything, but Canterbury is at the top of my list. So it was a great pleasure to go through the first three and to dig even more into the very first one with you. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, a, a few people might be playing Canterbury for the first time. And, you know, this weekend and as opening weekend, a lot of people are excited about it, obviously. For people who may not be familiar with the track in general, how would you say it tends to play in terms of both the dirt and or the turf? Obviously, you were down at Gulfstream over the championship meet down there. And that was a turf course that really favored front end speed. Just curious if there's any sort of way in which the two surfaces play at Canterbury. Uh, it goes pretty much the same uh, for the most mm. part. We are dependent on weather. We do get quite a bit of rain usually throughout the summer. Now, last year was not the case and it made it a very, very hard, firm turf course. We just had a drought. There's nothing you can do about that. And it played even more speed than normal, but it typically is a uh, of course, that's favorable to front runners. Now, the main track can it can loosen up a little bit, but for the most part, it is a very speed friendly surface too. And especially when it gets wet, it can be very difficult to pass. Uh, it it tends to dry out at a pretty normal rate, so you won't see an exponential change to the course of a card like you would at Churchill. But mm -hmm. for the most part, it give an extra look to horses that like to be closer to the front end. This is just a track that's always played their way. Gotcha. Good to know. Uh, certainly as we dive into this nine race card and listen, let's just get into it because this is, uh, I think, a pretty exciting card to talk about. Two stakes races on the card as well. But we're going to start off here in race number one, which goes a mile on the turf for three year olds and up. And Angela, as the guest, I'll kick things over to you. So if you want to talk about your top pick in this one, the number four NK Rocket Man. I thought maybe we'd start with yours since it's a little more interesting and we overlapped, <laughs> but I guess that would be a good transition because NK Rocketman, frankly, is not the most exciting first selection I've ever put out of the season. <laughs> I think he'll be in the neighborhood of like nine to five, but this is a split with the fifth race of the same card. And I thought that this one came up with less pace than that prong of it did. NK Rocketman has been running recently. That's always something that you have to take into account here. You get a lot of horses off layoffs. You get a lot of horses shipping in. And you just get some different factors to a whole new meet starting up. NK Rocketman does have the recency, the speed, and the turf form to him. So in a, trying to find a price, I had to go a little bit later in the card, and I settled in on him on top to kick things off. Yeah, it's certainly a difficult horse to get by. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, trainer Matt Williams, very good on the low-level claimers at uh, Canterbury on the turf. 
But interestingly enough, only one for 15 over the last five years off a trainer change. This is a horse that is going from one barn to another. Uh, and so at a short price, I decided to try to go to a different selection here. I went to the number five, Mishko, six to one. This is also your value play. Uh, this is an interesting horse to me. I think you can easily draw a line through that August 31st race and November uh, 7th race in terms of those previous two turf efforts prior to the April 24th, uh, 22nd effort, I should say, at Lone Star. And when you look at all of the other turf efforts this horse has put out there, the speed figures, they they make sense. The horse really fits in this type of a spot. It's a shorter field. This horse does tend to be a deep closer. What you just said about the tra uh, track favoring front end speed might be a little bit uh, problematic, but I was hoping in a shorter field, this horse could sit a little bit closer to the pace, actually maybe replicate that trip it sat at Sam Houston where, or at Lone Star I should say, where she, you know, she, uh, he was only, you know, two and a half, you know, lengths really off the lead early on staying close and then maybe able to make up some ground late. But that was where I went with a little bit of value. I didn't know if you had any other thoughts on Mishko uh, as your value play in race one. I, I do like Mishko quite a bit. I took, I took him second and in referencing the race that you talked about where he sat pretty close to the pace, he got one pace for me that day. I didn't see much of a move forward, and I think that this horse might be further back as a result. I think they might try to take him back and make a move. But mm -hmm. Mishko had some question marks to still go with that recency. He had enough I liked about him, and I thought the price would be a lot better than NK Rocket Man. And in just quickly re rewinding to the trainer switch that you talked about, uh, they bought this horse from his breeder, Harris Farms. And mm -hmm. this is also... Uh, Matt's horse, at least in part. And I like that NK Rocket Man got picked out by a horseman like Matt Williams. He thought he would fit well in this certain scenario. And he brings that speed. I like when they handpick these sort of horses. And he seems to be one that he thought would fit Canterbury. So just another reason I like him. Now, Mishko is your top pick. It's my value pick. And I know that another one of our handicappers here really loves your value pick, Chocolate Ice Cream. But I want to hear why you like him. Yeah, this one, I, I don't like this horse to win uh, in, in many ways because <laughs> this is a horse that is uh, Rarick, uh, Lynn Rarick, the trainer, is one for three, 33 off trainer changes, uh, so not a great number. But again, when you go back and when you go through the form and look at these turf efforts, they make sense. Also, last year, this horse won two times out of 10 starts, but those two efforts, those two winning efforts, both came going long on the Canterbury turf at this exact same level of claiming 75. So I thought in terms of a placement of this horse, this made a lot of sense. This horse has had success at this level on this track going this distance just last season uh, with some of these horses that are turf horses that then over the winter have to run on the dirt. You can just toss a lot of recent form, I think, and look at how this horse performed more last year. So I thought at five to one on the morning line, this horse provided a little bit of value, obviously a little bit of a shorter price actually than my top pick, but I still thought a horse to certainly consider in vertical exotics, uh, even if you do like a more chalky to choice up top. Yeah, I use chocolate ice cream a little bit further underneath. And I will say for the trainer's part, not that the trainer changes, but the owner stays the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, chocolate ice cream, they're very familiar with him, I will say, in that camp. And just one more note on race one before I let us move on, or I'll talk forever about it. Uh, keep an <laughs> eye on I'm a Harley 2 later in the season. I'm a Harley 2 likes this turf course a lot, has speed, but just throws in clunkers right off the bench. He yep. just needs one to get everything fired up in the engine room. And then he's good to go. And usually he's a, a fair value when he does get going. But I just had to give him this one and wait for him another day. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a horse actually later in the card that I'll probably touch on. That's actually the opposite that tends to fire really well off the long layoff and then regress a little bit as the season goes on. So it's funny how you, there are those tendencies with horses where you just can go back. And that's the beauty of these horses that do run at the same track and the same circuit every year, you can go back mm -hmm. and look at how did they do last year? How did they do two years ago? How did they do three years ago coming off these layoffs to have a little bit better sense of what you can expect on Saturday? Right. And the Minnesota breads are where I'm going to excel with that. So they're hitting <laughs> us in the numbers with a couple of stakes races opening night. Absolutely. So speaking of one of those stakes races, we have the 10,000 Lakes Stakes going six furlongs for three-year-old and up. And uh, this one felt uh, pretty inevitable in terms of where to go up top. And that was, of course, the even money favorite for Tim Padilla uh, with um, Alfredo uh, Alonso Quinones, I should say, aboard. And 
I, this is a course that's just been running against absolutely outstanding competition, both at Tampa Bay Downs and at Oak Lawn Park against horses like Sibelius, against a horse like Skelly, who I think is one of the top sprinters in the country, a uh, horse like Go West and Rugs, who I think are both uh, very nice sprinters as well. We actually just saw Rugs in a stakes race uh, at Pimlico on Black Eyed Susan Day. So there's a a lot of class that this horse has been running against. Six for seven in the money at Canterbury Lifetime with four victories. Nine for 12 in the money at this distance with five victories. Uh, from the inside rail, uh, this horse is just going to go and going to be a full send. Uh, and I would imagine... Uh, probably will take them gate to wire. So I don't know. I didn't have a lot of questions or concerns with Dr. Oscar. This is one of my stronger opinions on the card. And I see this is also your top pick as well. There's just so many things to like about him. I, I don't mind the rail draw with the fact that hotshot kid drew next door. He's not usually on the gas right out of the gate and affords Dr. Oscar the chance to probably get comfortable. Uh, the company that he's kept lately, the form that he's been in, the speed that he shows. You would assume that Alonzo Quinones had the choice between him and one of the defending champs in here, the alligator hunter. He opts for Dr. Oscar just at this very moment in 2023. I think that he's one of the best that they could get in the 10,000 lengths, and he's better than anybody who isn't here. He's just going to be a very short price. He's going to be a single in a lot of tickets. If you do like somebody else, you're going to get better value on them than you would in a lot of other spots. But uh, I didn't like anybody else. I see it exactly the way you did. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of the value, uh, you like that horse right to the next uh, to Dr. Oscar that you referenced just a second ago, Hot Shot Kid at 10 to 1. What makes you uh, interested in this one in a rather short field? Hotshot Kid doesn't always throw in his best shot, but <laughs> when he does, he can do just about anything. He's cool. I mean, he can sprint. Yeah. He can go long on the dirt, on the turf, whatever. And if he does win this race, he becomes the winningest Minnesota bred of all time. Oh, wow. So there's something on the line. And they've put him in spots where he's either come into trouble or he might be a little bit past his peak in form. It looks like he's been working pretty well leading up to this. And some of those sharper works out of a nine-year-old really catch your eye. I mean, they're 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 tightening the screws a little bit with this horse, probably more so than they normally would in the 10,000 lakes because they want to get him to that milestone and they got to take the spots where they can. So here they are. He should, certainly should have pace to run at. And if this horse works up to or runs up to his works, I think that he could throw a price into the exacta. I'm going to take him second. And that's what I did. Yeah, I, I had the same kind of logic with just a slightly different horse. Zavy Davy, the number five on the far outside, uh, 10 to one on the morning line for McLean Robertson uh, with Gallardo aboard. And this is a horse that will, you know, come running late uh, and certainly is going to be hoping that the Alligator Hunter and Dr. Oscar just set really fast fractions up front uh, and they can run into something there late. The other thing that I liked about this horse is even though, you know, Typically, he's a turf horse. He does have some nice enough dirt efforts. He's versatile in that he can go short. He can also go long. He's finished fourth in two state bred stakes races uh, last year at Canterbury. And again, a 10 to 1, a price that I would include underneath in an, an exact or a trifecta uh, type of a situation. So Xavier Davy was where I went as well. And, and I agree. I mean, if you if you like another choice other than Dr. Oscar, I would imagine everybody else's price is going to float up significantly by the time post comes. So you can get yourself a price, even on a horse. I imagine like the alligator hunter, even if you like that one a little bit more, because I think Dr. Oscar is going to, you know, go down, as you said, uh, pretty significantly and be below even money by the time the post opens up. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, Xavier Dave and hotshot kid, half brothers, five years apart. Yeah. They both have a lot of versatility to them. I can see your points with him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go to race number three on the card. And this is a $5,000 claimer going uh, six furlongs for three-year-olds and up. And you're not seeing double. Uh, in fact, Angela and I completely agree are in our complete lockstep in this race uh, with Birdie Machine. But I will kick things off to you first to talk a little bit about this nine to five horse. <laughs> I like Birdie Machine. Off that last race, I know that it was a 62.50. This is a relative level for him to get his third win. Now, have you seen Birdie Machine race? I know that you've watched some replays, but yeah. mm -hmm. taking a look at him, I holy have. cow. Yeah, he supersizes it every time he goes <laughs> he to the does. feed bucket. He's a big, big horse. Yeah. So, I mean, they took it took a little while to get him going to the races. They still started him off in a maiden special weight. He showed him something, but he is still five with only five starts to him. So I'm not as worried about him being at this level just let's put him somewhere he can win. You know, they're they're past the point of testing the waters with Birdie Machine, no matter what his ability is. He's shown enough of it lately to win this. And I question 
how close their morning lines are, how close they're going to be on the board. I think birdie machine will provide maybe even two to one, five to two. Whereas my Noah might just take a ton of money by virtue of the connections and mm -hmm. the track that he's shipping in from, as opposed to the birdie machine. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And it's funny you mentioned the size of birdie machine. Uh, one of my favorite horses actually was rock hard 10, uh, who yeah. looked like a different breed of animal, uh, <laughs> you know, compared to everybody else that he was running against. Uh, and birdie machines, yeah. one of those horses where like when they're loading into the gate, I'm like, wait a second, is that like, it, is this horse supposed to be in this race? Like, you know, sort of a thing. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, part of the other reason as well that I went with birdie machine over a horse like my Noah, you know, obviously they're right next to each other in terms of price, eight to five and nine to five. I agree mm -hmm. with you about where this price could end up by post time. But the thing with my Noah is this is a horse that's one for 14 lifetime. And I just, you know, at a short price, I just have a hard time picking horses that just don't win very often. Uh, and only one second place as well. Whereas with birdie machine three for five in the exact with two wins already in his career. So I just think this is a horse that's peaking at the right time. And certainly is ascending. You saw that nice progression second time out from that long layoff at Hawthorne. Uh, and also the jockey trainer combination, Last year, limited sample size, but 31% win rate with a 386 ROI. Uh, you always have to like seeing those types of winning connections there. So that horse made a ton of sense for me up top. And I didn't see a huge price necessarily as a value play. And, and I clearly neither did you, but I did go right next door to New Dice as a horse that uh, I just mentioned about my Noah not winning uh, a lot. New Dice also seems allergic to winning in many ways. One for 25 uh, career <laughs> lifetime but nine for 25 in the money. And so this is a horse that does tend to run really well and give a really hard, honest effort every single time. And I just, I, I think this makes a lot of sense. I think this horse should sit behind the pace, obviously, and come running a little bit late, very consistent runner. And I just think at nine to two, if you're going to try to find a way to, you know, maybe try to find an alternative to the top two, or if you're trying to find a price to use underneath, I think new dice makes a lot of sense. Yeah, New Dice would definitely be one of those underneath sorts of horses, like you said. You can count on him to be coming late, and if it rains, definitely mm. you have to boost his chances way, way up while decreasing the chances of some others. Love the wet track, but there's not a lot of rain in the forecast. So with that <laughs> in mind, I did take New Dice underneath. I, I couldn't get creative, and I didn't see birdie machine being out at the top two and sometimes yeah. at this time of year when horses are coming back off the shelf you see an even bigger disparity as far as their odds and really what comes in they need the fitness after a race or two yeah. they often come back a little bit more together and you can find more value at least in a race like this where some of them really need the race yeah and it's a great point you make and it's one where anybody handicapping this goes back to what we were talking about earlier one looking at past performances to go how does this horse typically respond off these long layoffs but also looking to your point you made about one of the horses in the previous race just how much are they tightening the screws before they're coming back from these sorts of layoffs you know are they firing off bullets are they just kind of taking it nice and easy is it you know one of these you know type of efforts where this is a leg stretcher and just for building foundation and conditioning uh for later on in the season so a lot of things that you can do to kind of i think you know, read between the lines a little bit to see what type of effort some of these horses might be potentially sitting on coming off of a long layoff. Yes. Let's move to race number four on the card, which is a $27,000 maiden special weight going six furlongs for three to five-year-old fillies. And I know you have a pretty strong feeling about number four. And I saw that by somebody who posted this online. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, I ended up on the exact same horse. And I was like, oh, I really wish I could have disagreed with uh, Angela on this race. Uh, but I also have a big oh. fan of Allotrope here, uh, getting Lasix for the first time and going back to what this horse, I think, does best, which is sprinting. Uh, last time out went that mile and 70 at Hawthorne now cutting way back. Uh, the trainer Joel burnt is 60 or I'm sorry, 40% first time using Lasix. I just think there's a lot to like here in terms of the speed figures. This horse absolutely fits. And I think we'll take a step forward, uh, off of that extended effort going longer and now cutting back to that initial, uh, five and a half for a long, now six for a long distance here in this maiden special weight. But what drew you to this seven to two shot? Well, she's one another one of those very much recency plays. If mm -hmm. if you look at some of her competition, even though they have more starts lifetime, she's got two in these recent times where most of them have just one 
or don't have any in the case of mm-hmm. first time starters. And a lot of those don't come from barns that necessarily really tighten them up to get ready to go off the layoff. So if you look for maybe an older horse, I'm sure that that's one of the things that you liked about nine crowns as opposed to one of the three year olds. Mm-hmm. You just see things maybe that you wouldn't like about them. And she's the only four-year-old in this field, but even further down the cards, you have to decide if you're willing to take an unfit four-year-old or a fit three-year-old that might not be there yet. And I try to take the fit three-year-old who has shown enough going short, where I think that a lot of those things, like the move back, she's learned how to break. She has some recency. She's had some Mm. decent works too. I mean, don't be dismayed by any slow times coming out of Hunter Farm. If they have a bullet, they have a bullet. And you mentioned the Lasix. He is two for three, adding Lasix to horses, you know, not first-time starters, and getting them into the winner circle, that being Joel Burnt. All of this, of course, equates to maybe two to one, but Allotrope is in the right spot, I believe, to break her maiden. Yeah, I think so. The horse feels like, yeah, just a very logical uh, horse to use in this sort of a spot. But we do differ a little bit in terms of our value play. And so you referenced the horse that I like, uh, number seven, nine crowns, second back from a long layoff, had run at Turfway Park last time out. And I, I thought ran perfectly fine. And really with this horse, uh, what I'm hoping for is that July 9th effort of last year. That was really the effort where, uh, you know, the horse almost broke her uh, maiden at that point finished second by a neck that day. And I I think there is certainly some talent there. This is a trainer who has had some success limited, but some success second back from a long layoff. And I I think this is a horse that certainly at a big price, 12 to one on the morning line can provide you a little bit of value underneath on some of these plays. If you like some more, uh, shorter prices up top. I do think this is a horse that is potentially sitting on a nice effort. You mentioned the fact that this is a little bit of a speed favoring track. I would imagine based upon that career best effort back last July, that their plan is probably to send because that seems to be this horse's best bet in terms of getting into the money or into the winner circle potentially. So that's why, you know, I ultimately won with the number of seven, nine crowns, but interested in hearing your horse that will be trying to live up to its name, Russian to the wire. <laughs> uh, yeah, she comes from the same barn. She's the younger of the two Valerie yeah. Lund trainees. I-, I like that they sent her over to Oakland to make her first start of the year instead of keeping her turf paradise. Both of these fillies were training down there. This one decided to come east. And Russian to the wire, just her, her races last year impressed me a little bit more than Nine Crowns. That race that you do mention where she ran second hasn't come back as the most live heat that's run at the maiden special weight level. We'll see how it stacks up to these three-year-olds because naturally that puts her a step ahead. But I was wondering if maybe the inside filly would take a little less money, your filly would take a little bit more money and provide more value there. But if you look at their set of races that they put together, you can find one in the past that sort of level up. So I could see you liking one or the other from the Lund Barn, but they were my choices for underneath the, underneath the four just because they do have all that experience to draw from. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned there are some first time starters, some, you know, some horses that may not be particularly fit coming back from a little bit of a layoff. So I, I do think there's an opportunity to find a little bit of value here, hopefully underneath in this particular race. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move to race number five, which is, uh, kind of the second half of that race. Number one that you had mentioned earlier, uh, which is the exact same condition, $7,500, uh, claimer going a mile on the turf for three-year-olds and up. And for this one, your top pick was a horse I liked underneath, but you feel really strongly about the number five meet Joe. So tell me why I'm wrong. Just using this one as a value play. And, and, uh, I, I love to see 10 to one up top. I just didn't like anybody else in here. Yeah, I hear you on that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the fresh face that I know likes turf. And I know that the barn, it, it isn't always a high percentage barn on the turf. They don't have a whole bunch of horses, but they do very well for themselves. Now, Meet Joe has enough speed to keep himself in the mix. I don't know if he'll be outright setting the pace. I thought it would be livelier than the first event of the day, but only by about that much. Because I think (laughs) uh, Fredonian has to go on the inside and he would be my value play as a result. I'm going to tie these two together because I think they're the only two that want to go faster than 49 seconds for the first half mile. So Mm -hmm. I just wanted to take the one that I thought might be the longer price that had a little more statistical uh, positivity backing him up i saw a lot of (laughs) offers with switches and things on the inside horse but i will warn you that joe roberts has sent out more than one price that has pulled off a wire to wire job on our turf course and some of them had form just like this or maybe even worse now 
he drifted out on his left lead. He looked very tired and spent last time. He would need a complete 180, but I will say that has happened before with a Joe Roberts horse. So don't toss that horse out of the mix, especially considering the speed he has. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I do like Meet Joe quite a bit, obviously, uh, as my value play. And this is a horse that uh, I, I like horses like this, where you really have to look through the running lines. I mean, there's only kind of two recent career turf efforts. Uh, and there, there was another attempt to get this horse on the turf that got taken off. But there's something there. I mean, this horse definitely does perk up on the turf. And uh, mm -hmm. like you said, will represent early speed. So I thought this horse at 10 to one on the morning line presented great value. Uh, even if you think maybe this horse gets caught late by somebody, uh, I still think this horse is going to put himself in a position to really run a big race. Uh, one of the horses that I referenced earlier, not by name, but by past performances is actually the number six horse who uh, um, go for gold, who is the inverse of what we were talking about earlier. This is a horse that is great off the layoff but tends to then decline throughout the rest of the meet a little bit. Um, this is a horse whose speed figures always go down the second and third time out after a layoff. That said, I still couldn't really make it, uh, make it work for this horse coming back from the layoff. I think this horse has been declining a little bit uh, in recent times and is not coming into this and did not finish up last season maybe as strong as uh, he's finished up previous season. So as a result, my top play was number two, Thick Haze, uh, three to one on the morning line. Uh, this is a horse that's five for eight winning on the turf at Canterbury Park. Uh, the only three losses, two of them were in stakes level races and one was in a higher level optional claimer. So you could say, you know, this horse was just maybe in over its head in the other three races where it didn't win or didn't even hit the board on the Canterbury turf. Makes a lot of sense here. It's been keeping, I think, pretty decent form at Turf uh, Paradise. And, you know, two recent second place finishes and an optional claimer 12 and a claiming eight. So uh, I just thought this is a horse at three to one. Granted, you're not getting a huge price here, but seems like a pretty consistent horse that turns in pretty consistent speed figures. And in a race like this where some horses are coming back from a long layoff, I thought was worthy at least of potentially using as a top pick. So I went there as my top pick in this one, but glad I, I might end up going all in on Meet Joe. You never know. Now that <laughs> now that you're uh you're 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 twisting my arm on this one and persuading me a little bit. So uh, thick case is probably the horse to beat. I just thought the pace wouldn't work out very favorably for him, but yeah. he's versatile enough. I think it's fair to say he was a touch overrated for a while, but now that he's yeah. found his level and he's running consistently at it, I don't blame you for taking the case. It was just a pace thing. I think the pace is going to be slow in both uh, halves of that particular condition. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's move to race number six, which is a $16,000 optional claimer going six furlongs for three-year-olds and up. And we do have, a, shockingly, a, a complete difference of opinion. There's no overlap <laughs> in this race. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can toss out Mr. M nice Guy, uh, Ms. Nice Girl. Uh, and so we are uh, going in, in different directions here, but I, I think this is an interesting race. My top pick was the number three boat song, a two-to-one on the morning line for uh, McLean Robertson. And... I just think this is a horse that has great early speed and just has a huge pace advantage over the rest of the field. I like that this horse is coming out of Oaklawn with ascending speed figures last three times out, 73, 74, 80 uh, in terms of buyer speed figures. Uh, again, the jockey trainer combination, very strong, 28% last year with a $6.26 ROI. Uh, so I did like that as well. So I, we've also seen, and this is something that just because I'm obsessed with following a Cinnaboya, I've noticed with some other tracks that these Oaklawn shippers are doing really well shipping into other tracks, uh, you know, whether it be a Cinnaboya, whether it be so, you know, Woodbine, whether it be some of these other uh, tracks that are now opening up in the spring and summer. And so I, maybe I'm overvaluing that Oaklawn form, but that's something that I do take into really strong consideration. And you had mentioned earlier, you know, versus the going to Turf Paradise or staying at Turf Paradise versus going to Oaklawn. So uh, that was where I went with my top pick, but I uh, did absolutely take a long look at your top selection, Reckoning Day. I Yeah, I took Reckoning Day, which I normally wouldn't. I wouldn't, I probably would go the way of a boat song if there wasn't so much speed in here and you didn't break so slow. But I will say that Oakland form, especially when the starter allowance ranks and the claimers is some of the saltiest in the whole country. So wherever they go, you know, a $65,000 claimer, that's a rare number is going to be an allowance <laughs> horse. The next place that he goes, especially when that place is Canterbury and boat song will be tough. 
But Reckoning Day has improved very well himself and is mm -hmm. just as versatile. I thought that Reckoning Day drawing to his outside was going to be in a favorable position and might even drift up from the three to one that he is in the morning line. He got stuck on his left lead the last time that he ran. He still got the job done and he continued to ascend up to that optional claimer level. It was an $8,000 bunch essentially, but he's earned his way into a step like this. And I think that the price will be right. I just think that he'll probably be an overlay. And in this sort of group, I, I don't know. I, I think that there's a lot of comparable ability but mm -hmm. there's not a lot separating them. So I tried to find the best overlay and I think that he might end up being it. Excellent. Well, your value play was one of my favorite names on the entire card. Uh, Colonel Clank, if anybody ever is old enough to remember watching Hogan's Heroes, uh, which I used <laughs> to watch on basic cable growing up as a kid, uh, that was a character on the show, which, by the way, that show, just as a complete sidebar, would never be made today. Uh, that was just a show that was like where the Nazis were just these like buffoons that were kind of funny and uh, had a sense of humor and yeah, making fun of World War II and making light of World War II prisoners of war, probably not as something. Uh, but it was the 60s, and why not make a show about that? But uh Colonel Clink, the horse. Let's talk about this one. Five to one on Let's the morning. Take it line. back, okay? Uh, yeah, no, we got to take it back. So we we didn't decide. We came right back. Uh, but uh, Colonel Clink, what drew you to this horse uh, as a as a value play in this particular race? Uh, he he likes their track decently. He's only run over it twice. But I was looking for a horse that could come from off the pace. I just don't mm -hmm. see Boat Song getting clear of Astronaut Oscar of Your Romantic of even Lucky McCoy. I just thought that things might get a bit too hot up front. So in trying to find somebody who could take advantage, I thought it could be Colonel Clink. He's been running plenty recently. You know, he doesn't really threaten anybody, but he is going to, I think, be in a good spot that'll stack him up against the kind of competition that he's been facing recently. And maybe he's just figured it out. You know, he hasn't won in a mm. couple of years. He pays for himself, essentially, and Colonel Clink can still hang with these folks. So it, I took two horses that I thought, like I said, in a in a field that might have relative ability to it, mm -hmm. take two horses that could be just a little bit more than they show on the morning line. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I went with number eight, Astronaut Oscar at eight to one on the morning line. You referenced this as a horse that likely is going to be part of the early pace scenario. Um, I, it's interesting. I don't know exactly what to make of this horse. That's why you're getting eight to one. I think this horse can yeah. be a little on off. Uh, for sure. I am willing to kind of excuse the last effort, drawing the inside rail on a sprint uh, in a sprint and some, you know, just having a little bit of issue there in terms of kind of getting through. And so now you're doing this kind of, it, it's, you don't see this move all the time, but I do like to sometimes bet horses that go from the far inside rail to the far outside post uh, mm -hmm. in sprints, you know, between races. So this horse should be able to sit the sort of trip that it wants. And, presumably will be able to slot in if he wants to kind of go to the lead he'll be able to do that but if he wants to sit second or third he'll be able to do that too and kind of sit off a little bit uh and apply some pressure i'm always torn with sprints in general i know i have some friends of mine that i talk to about horse racing a lot where we are always torn between do you go go with a closer in these sprints or do you just go with the speed of the speed in some instances or do you just go listen the front end speed's going to carry and you got to look at the horses that are going to be on the, on the front end so i'm always torn half the time i go with closers half the time i go with uh front end speed some some days it feels like i'm choosing the wrong time uh, in each way but uh with astronaut oscar i thought at 8 to 1 you're at least getting a price on a horse that when he runs his best race is a nice value, I think. It's just a matter oh, of whether yeah. you're going to get that best race. Uh, and I, I think that's the question mark, and that's why you get the value there. Yeah, he's the kind of horse that you need to talk to so that you can see what kind of day <laughs> he's having and maybe bet accordingly, but we can't do that. Usually he's not bet. Usually he is a fair value, but yeah. all of his best races, at least in recent times, have been on the front end. He's just not yeah. the kind that wants any dirt in his face or something along those lines, so... Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I tend to agree with you in deciding what do you go with, but I tend to go for speed or a horse like Reckoning Day that can turn his hand yeah. to just about anything. If you get a horse with ability and versatility and a decent price, yep. sold. Fire away. Fire uh, away. <laughs> exactly. So let's go to race number seven on the card, which is a $10,000 claimer going seven and a half furlongs on the turf for three-year-old and up fillies and mares. And uh, let's talk about your top pick here uh, because I was rather boring because I didn't even, I couldn't even figure out a value play. I just had a top pick <laughs> that I just doubled up. Uh, and so uh, let's talk about your top pick. Who's also uh, my 
hey, or your value plays also my top pick, but let's talk about uh, elegance and tonic at three to one. And what drew you to this horse as your top selection in race seven? I'm just interested to see what they're going to do with her as far mm. as tactics, because elegance and tonic has been a little bit better when she's on the lead. She can sit from off it. And she showed that at Hawthorne last year, that she does have more to her than just being a one trick pony. But uh, Barbara Roloff on the inside is seemingly a touch faster than she is. So if she takes that one out of her game, what do they do? Are they going to sit in second? I'm just interested to see what tactics they're going to take with both of them. Because obviously I would want Elegance and Tonic to at least be close, if not dictating terms, because there's not an overwhelming amount of speed in here. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, I just, I don't have a real strong opinion in here. I'm not going to lie. I took Elegance and Tonic because she can put herself where she needs to be in the race. But I don't think that there's a whole ton separating the field as far as ability goes, and especially going seven and a half on the turf because there's not that many right. <laughs> proven commodities. So uh, yeah. elegance and tonic is the way that I went, but a mild conviction at that. Yeah, no, I I think that was the horse that uh, if I hadn't gone with she's uh, she's on easy street. That's the horse I would have absolutely chosen as my top pick. And and then once I made the decision to go with she's on easy street as my top pick. I realized I probably should have picked elegance and tonic because I have no value play now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it was, it was one of those where, you know, if you can, and we should probably talk about the way that, you know, other, some other horses in this race, but for instance, like the number seven, Jewel Azul, who is the morning line favorite, I believe at five to two, this is a horse that's one for 27 lifetime. And I just can't use a one for 27 lifetime horse on as my top pick. And this is a horse that's over 20 on the turf. And so I just, I mean, this horse finishes underneath a lot, but this horse finishes in the money quite a bit, but I just can't use that horse as my top pick. And once you get past Jewel Azul, then everybody else kind of looks pretty similar, like you said, in terms of, you know, around the same levels. And some of the really big prices in this field are trying dirt or trying turf, I should say, for the first time. Yeah. And there's not necessarily a lot to suggest that they're going to take to it. So, you know, as a result, I ended up on She's on Easy Street, who has two career turf efforts. And this was the surface in which she broke her maiden and she broke her maiden going seven and a half furlongs on the Canterbury turf. And the race before that, she finished second going a mile on the Canterbury turf. Those are the only two career efforts there. There's clearly some talent. This horse can be pretty forwardly placed. And I just think, you know, based upon what you were saying earlier about the way the turf course plays, I think she makes a lot of sense. It's six to one. You're getting a little bit of a price. So that was my top pick and value play, but didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to she's on easy street. Well, the day that she broke her maiden, she did look really good in the paddock. So get a look at her before the race, I would say. Mm -hmm. if you're go I mean, if you're in horizontals, it's already too late. But if you're looking at wind betting, she <laughs> yeah. is one that can tip her hand a bit in the paddock. Um, I don't recall how big of a filly she is, but I do have a note that she looked really good the day that she broke her maiden. So keep an eye on her. Make sure she's behaving herself and that she's as well turned out as she was that day. She'll need that kind of effort, I think, to beat Elegance and Tonic. Yeah, I would agree. I, I yeah, I would agree with that. But I do think that once you get past elegance and tonic, there's a lot of sameness in in this uh, field. <laughs> yeah, except and for Jewel so, Azul. Yeah, I've yeah, seen enough yeah. Of her. yeah. Right. Yeah. I just I, she may win, and if she beats me, good for her. But I just mm -hmm. can't use her uh, at that price uh, with that career okay. record. So, uh, well, let's move to the penultimate race on the card, number eight, which is the thirty-two thousand thousand dollar allowance, going five and a half furlongs for three-year-old and up, and this is a Minnesota bred race. And uh, I went to the far outside with my top selection, Roses by Liam. And this is a Tim Padilla horse with Quinonas aboard. Uh, interestingly enough, Padilla is 29% shipping in for state bred races at Canterbury over the last five years. Kind of, it seems like an obscure statistic, but actually it has a, <laughs> it, but actually has a decent size. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but actually has a decent sized uh, N to, to take a look at. So, mm -hmm. um, Listen, this horse is coming in from Tampa Bay and has run at a lot of different levels, you know, has run at, you know, or in distances, I should say, has run a mile 40 most recently, but it seems to do best sprinting, uh, going seven furlongs, going six furlongs and going back to its debut effort, actually running five and a half furlongs, almost winning that day, finishing second uh, by a length and a half. And so I think this, there is some question about whether or not this is long enough for this particular horse at nine to two in the morning line, I'm willing to kind of maybe find out, but this is a horse that's coming out of a 
$75,000 optional claimer down at Tampa. So they clearly thought enough to put that horse in that spot. And the horse actually attracted quite a bit of money that day, went off as a three to one choice. So uh, there is some talent there. And I just think this horse, again, pretty versatile, can sit a few different types of trips, can sit up close, uh, can sit a little further back, depending on the pace scenario. So I went with this as my top selection, but interested in obviously your thoughts as that was my value play. Happy baby, Bob, happy hour, Bobby. <laughs> I, I, easy for me to say at Happy six to one in the morning. Yeah. Uh, at six to one on the morning line. So talk about the number nine a little bit. Uh, happy hour. Bobby is a four-year-old and that was my main argument for him. Mm. There's lots of ability with your horse. I will, I, I will give him some kudos, especially for the two turn experience. He now has that mm. some of his competition in the Minnesota Derby may be limited in or have none of by the time they get to that spot. So <laughs> A good way to keep him simmering if he doesn't win today. Still, there are bigger fish for him to fry down the road, and mm -hmm. the ability is definitely there. But happy hour, Bobby showed speed against some horses who would be heavy, heavy favorites in here. I mean, you can look at some of the company he's kept. Yep. Love the Nest, Dr. Oscar, Magic Castle, Bayou Benny. They were some of the best that they could offer in the Minnesota Red Sprint ranks, and happy hour, Bobby took it to him for a long time. Yes, he ended up with quite a few seconds and thirds in, in doing so, but still, he switched barns. Max had some time with him. He does have that maturity edge on some of the other three-year-olds, regardless of their talent quotient. And he landed outside of a lot of his pace pressure. I mean, happy hour Bobby might get clear of them anyway. But if somebody mm -hmm. wants to go up and lock horns with them, at least they'll be to his inside. I figured. Harry Hernandez is going to be aboard him. He has kept the faith with him, knows this horse very well. And he is one of those horses. If you do look into the stats like you have, I mean, He's five for 28, taking over horses off long layoffs. Mm -hmm. These are some of his specialties anyway, that being Minnesota bred. So happy hour, Bobby checked a lot of boxes. And I think even in a full field, we'll still provide some sort of price on the board, probably not six to one, but he made tons and tons of sense in this group. Yeah, uh, I totally and absolutely agree. And what's interesting is, when I have these and when I have a guest on with Captain in the card, a lot of times I try to also have like a third choice. And I'm like, well, you know, if our, like the guest and I overlap too much, the third choice, I'll kind of, you know, just so we talk about a few different types of horses, I'll kind of sub in. Well, my third choice in this race was Yo Dog. So I didn't make any changes. Uh, this is a horse I also really liked a lot and is actually the inverse, I think, of what you typically see, where you typically see the perk up on turf. Here you saw the perk up on dirt, and and it feels like they got this horse on the right surface finally. But mm -hmm. uh, you, you clearly like this one as a value play at eight to one. I think he pulled a bit of an upset that day too. He was in there with another yeah. Lothenbach horse named Rejection Hurts, who was a lower price on the board. Yo Dog ran great though, and both switching surfaces and getting an extra furlong, I thought maybe yeah. all helped Yo Dog put the pieces together. And like you said, maybe he's just wanted dirt this whole time. He's another four-year-old, but he does have to prove it against winners still. I mean, mm -hmm. doing it against Minnesota Breds coming out of that uh, open company might level that playing field a touch. He's going well right now. He's another big dude. I mean, he's had two races a year, and then they've had to stop on him. Hopefully the second one is as good as the first one because then it can really make a race of it. But I thought that these two might actually be the ones that I narrow it down to in some of my horizontal tickets. Mm. I respect Roses by Liam, like I said, but these two really stood out for some yeah. different reasons. But I think that they're two of the most talented ones in here. Yeah, absolutely. I can believe this is going to be a really good race, I think. I I'm excited to watch this one on Saturday for sure. Um, well, let's move to the final race on the card, which is a stakes race as well. The Lady Slipper Stakes going six furlongs for three-year-old nut fillies and mares, a Minnesota bred race as well. And <laughs> this was one where it was hard for us to get past two of the same horses again. You're not seeing double, and I didn't screw up in my copy and paste job. This is, in fact, uh, where we were in terms of that up top selection with Charlie's Penny. I'll let you kind of kick things off talking about this uh, choice, which I, I felt maybe Dr. Oscar was my strongest opinion in terms of like just the most obvious winner, but this one felt right there as well. Yeah. Charlie, if Charlie's penny wasn't facing so many, she yeah, would probably yeah. be my best bet on the card. I'm, I'm surprised that there's nine up against her. You know, there's yeah. really nice fillies in here, but having them already off the bench and putting them in this spot, she has a lot of game miss and it's going to be the best race on the card. I think, even though I think Charlie's penny will win, I she doesn't bring those two races into here that she did last year when she won the Minnesota Distaff mm -hmm. Sprint. She was really, really impressive, but we still haven't seen her since January. So seeing how she responds to that now that she's going to take her second try up here 
that's about the only question with her. Everything else stacks up beautifully and the outside draw is perfect for her. So shortest price of the day, one of the most likely winners of the day. And this, regardless of how it comes out, is going to be one of the most fun to watch and a great way to end opening night. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, the value play we both liked was the number five. She's my warrior 12 to one on the morning line for Tim Padilla. And what I like about this one is really zeroing in on those state bread races that this horse has run in. Because when you do that, this horse is two for four winning and three for four in the exact lifetime in those state bread races at Canterbury. Really, the only bad effort was going two turns, which I think you can easily excuse. This horse doesn't need the lead. Uh, can be certainly is is going to be a very fast horse. That's going to be part of the early pace, but doesn't need it a lot. Uh, it will need it to absolutely take a step forward in terms of overall speed figures and able to compete. But I think there's a lot to like there at a twelve to one price, and uh, I'd imagine you have your reasons for liking this one as well. Well, yeah, her state bred races have been against her own age, so yeah, read into that what you will. But they've all been very good, like you said, except for the two turn effort. And last time when she didn't break very well, had the inside, I think that she probably w was in a touch deep anyway. But then yep. putting her in that spot really put her behind the eight ball. So if you go back to the race two back where she was second to nightcap, I think nightcap was one to five in there. She's like eight for 14. That's a really tough way to start off your four-year-old year, but that's how she did it. And she ran pretty well to get second. I'm willing to forgive that one last time. And those two races behind her put her in a good spot, even though she is against the very toughest that we have as far as Minnesota bred distaff sprinters. And we'd be remiss, I have to mention clickbait, because she is trying yeah. to become the first three-time winner of the Lady Slipper. And there's a lot of Phillies who have been able to do it twice, but it'll be a big question to see if she can pull it off and make it three straight, because she is in a salty group this year. Absolutely. Very much so a salty group. And, uh, but she's gotten that ability to win off the bench as she's done it before. So you never know if she's going to be able to pull it off. And certainly a lot of history, potentially, you know, the winningest Minnesota bread, the, the first time trying to uh, win a three time for the lady slipper stakes. So some, a lot of really fun storylines to be following along on opening day at Canterbury park. Uh, Angela, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Let the folks know uh, about it because I know you're starting a little bit later than you normally do at Canterbury, but let them let you know about the uh, kind of duration of the meet and when people can uh, find you and kind of when the races are going to be taking place up there. Well, we're going to start off this weekend with Saturday, Sunday, and Memorial Day Monday, but we're going to start going three days a week in a different pattern until July. Now we're going to go Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, and keep that going until we add six Thursdays in through August, Ooh. July to August. There's one Wednesday that we're going to take off in there. I believe that's the 5th of July. And then we'll end at the same time that we did the past couple of years in the middle of September. So some changes throughout the mix, but Sundays will be family days every week. Saturdays, we will always start at five. Wednesdays, we will always start at five as well as Thursdays. And we start at one o'clock on Sundays as well as holiday racing uh, that is coming up on Monday. So that will, that part will stay consistent and some of the events that go on in between are going to be wild. And a lot of them take place on Sunday. So if you're looking to bring the kids out for something, if you're coming into town for something and you either want to see what's going on on the track, what kind of traffic you're going to be facing, <laughs> the website's your best resource because there's a lot of stuff going here. And that'll be an entirely different podcast to get into unicorns, llamas and all the other stuff. I love it. And uh, my hope this year is that I get up to Canterbury for the meet. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to do it over the 4th of July weekend, uh, but fingers crossed uh, being able to make it up there. So uh, going to be a lot of fun. Look forward to all of your coverage of Canterbury. Look forward to a great season up there and a great meet. Make sure to press that subscribe button here on YouTube. Make sure to like this video as well. Comment below with your best bet on the Canterbury card. Angela, thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, and make sure to obviously throw her a follow on Twitter at Angela Herman 15, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. All Thank right. You see, for the chat. this is always a good time. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's always fun. So, uh, listen, until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis, reminding you to have a great and profitable day at the races and reminding you that it's now post time.